Good morning, afternoon, evening. Welcome to another edition of the Best DFS Show that just happens to start at 8 Eastern Standard Time. My name is Rob Diamond. Rad Rob Diamond on Twitter. Sir Robert Six on all the main sites. Welcome to another edition of the EPL Breakdown for Saturday, January 19th, 2019. I'm absolutely pumped about this slate. I think there's all sorts of really interesting takes that we're going to be able to take stands on. Uh, some really interesting fades that I'm going to throw at you. Uh, I think there's a couple games that are worthless and we can absolutely look past as well so without really wasting too much time let's jump in here right away uh, as you can see a little bit of the screen share going on so let's just do the schedule really quickly the first game is West Ham making a really quick trip south to Bournemouth we have Crystal Palace making the trip from London uh, up to Liverpool to play Liverpool. Uh, Brighton making a huge trip up to Manchester to play Manchester United. Cardiff uh, making the undesirable trip over to uh, Newcastle way up north. Uh, Everton making the trip down to Southampton on the South Shore. Burnley making the huge trip from north into uh, London to play Watford. And the final game of the slate is an absolute banger. Uh, Chelsea making the really quick trip to Arsenal for a London Derby. So, yeah, I don't want to uh, waste too much time here. Let's jump right in and talk about this. There's a lot of things I want to cover. Uh, first game on the slate. Bournemouth uh, hosting West Ham. Uh, this is a game you're going to immediately have to take a stand on for the slate. A lot of this slate will determine which top salary you decide to take, whether it's a Salah, Hazard, uh, or I guess Pogba, we'll talk about him, but a, a Salah, Hazard, a Rashford, and to a lesser extent, Amabang. Um, it, it's tough to really say at this point, at the start of the video, which one you should take. We'll kind of draw a conclusion towards the end. I think they're all really good money this slate, uh, but it maybe one has a ceiling more than the other, and I'll present my idea, I'll present why, but let's just get right into this uh, West Ham Bournemouth game. I think uh, their salaries are really what defines this slate, and if you happen to take one of those big salaries that I was talking about, the next step, if it isn't a West Ham player in specific, if it isn't Philippe Anderson, uh, you're not going to be able to get Philippe Anderson because basically whatever else you take after that huge salary, it's going to be impossible to grab. So ownership is a big deal here for these kind of 8K-ish salaries that uh, Pogba's one will be talking about. So yeah, we can talk about first about Fleet Anderson. One of my issues with West Ham is that they don't really have a consistent set piece taker enough to the point where we can rely on uh, a consistent output. Now, Fleet Anderson takes some set pieces and corners. Snodgrass takes some set pieces and corners. Both of them are priced at relatively the same range. Uh, and in terms of uh, Aaron Cresswell is back in the mix of things too, which is absolutely awesome. If you're new to DFS soccer or you don't remember, Aaron Cresswell was putting in 15 crosses every single game last year uh, on the consistent. Like, it wasn't an issue at all. So I'm not expecting that kind of output again, especially from a team like West Ham, especially away from home. Uh, but a lot can be said about the fact they're better away from home this year than they have been at home. And that's saying something, especially in the past few years, where they've just been bad at home and away from home. Uh, they've never really been a very good home team. So it's saying a lot this season that they are doing so well away from home. Uh, they've already ma they've already exceeded excuse me, their away wins from last season. So the, it's tough to peg them this slate, though. The big issue here is that Fabanski is always going to be one of the better keepers of the slate as long as he's not so expensive. And you see on DraftKings, he isn't. So a lot of this has to do with whether or not you are feeling Bournemouth can reply. Because statistically speaking, West Ham are going to score this game. Bournemouth have been absolutely a disaster at uh, keeping out, uh, keeping clean sheets, keeping the ball out, keeping out multiple goals. So uh, consistently, it, it, we can even safely say West Ham's floor this slate is two goals. Now, one of the issues that we have with, with West Ham, especially off of DraftKings, when, when you move on to something like FanDuel, the big issue is that their chance creation is actually really poor in comparison to the amount of crosses that they put in. Snodgrass is awesome if you want 20 crosses, but he'll barely finish above double digits anymore. Um, so that's kind of a concern, especially now that he's 7.3K. Philippe Anderson's going to be the best player for West Ham 9 times out of 10, and he's going to deserve his most expensive salary in West Ham. But the real concern is that unless he gets both the goals or has a fairly tremendous game outside of a goal or needs both assists, he's really not going to have that dramatic of effect outside of maybe a lingering cash selection if you fall onto it. So in GPP, I really like West Ham. 
the issue is, again, they're West Ham, and it's just really tough to buy into this. Now, they're super injured at the back as well. So if you're looking for a team that you can rely on for a clean sheet, West Ham really aren't that. Now, that being said, they're one of the most winningness, if that's a word, if you want, I, I make it up, I'm making it up, sorry, uh, we're going to have to deal with it. One of the most winningness teams right now uh, in the English Premier League, especially in 2019, they've won six of their past nine games. Not many teams can boast that many wins, that sit outside the top like four or five you know big teams so it's uh, important to remember that West Ham are simply winning games because they're able to score goals now the big issue with West Ham is yes they're injured that's part of it even though they're injured their minutes are still really bad uh Snodgrass is someone that should be playing 90 minutes consistently, but he isn't. Now, I say that from a DFS perspective. Uh, from a real-life soccer perspective, if you want my take, this, the minutes are justified. He's not a fitness player. He's, a, he's, he's more likely to be used later in the season as a sub rather than uh, a true, outstanding, 90-minute, consistent player every week. So that's something to remember going forward he's just never in his career been a, a fitness player so he's going to cross the ball a ton same with Anderson I don't hate the idea of chasing more penalty shots this slate from what I can tell there's been a lot less penalty shots this season in the past uh, now that may be uh, I shouldn't say that throughout the entire season within the past couple months there, there hasn't been as many penalty shots as there has been and I think we're due for some if if you can say that which i know a lot of math based people don't like to hear but we should we've been seeing a serious regression in my opinion of the amount of penalties i'm expecting personally more penalties i'm sure lots of people have different statistics to say different things but that's just something i'm chasing here this slate and uh, again it worked out last slate really well with liverpool i don't hate it chasing it on west ham the issue is that mark noble takes them now if mark noble isn't on the field which is actually a, a possibility it's going to be arnautovic and if Arnautovic is not in the field, which is kind of a possibility, then it could be almost anyone. Fleet Anderson, Chikorito, if he's on the field. This is the issue for West Ham. Their minutes are really, really bad across the board. So, um, yeah, it, it would be nice to rely on some West Ham guys in cash, but they don't get the minutes. They don't really have enough of a substantial role. And the only guy that's in any way really viable would be Fleet Anderson or maybe Aaron Cresswell if he's starting because 4.5K isn't really that big of a and ask compared how bad Bournemouth have been lately. So yeah, moving on from West Ham, uh, I, I won't be targeting their forwards just because of minutes. Uh, so yeah, moving on from that to Bournemouth. The big issue with Bournemouth is that they've been conceding insane amounts of goals consistently. Uh, uh, two has been their magic number, their floor for letting in. Now, I wouldn't read too deep into that, and I definitely wouldn't read too deep into that. But considering Huddersfield's the worst offense and one of the league history worst offense so yeah um Born Bournemouth should concede at least twice again it it anytime they're facing an inept team at home uh you can kind of hedge on a gpp script that maybe they could get a clean sheet like you saw against Huddersfield or Brighton two rather inept away teams um and yeah it's it's tough. Again, like their defense is in a situation where none of them are really overly DFS viable, but in the scheme of things of a slate script for salaries, whenever you have to piece people together, they very regularly fall together. And uh, with Simon Francis out, that opens up a little bit different take because, again, like Charlie Daniels just hasn't been good enough this season. He was another guy very similar to Cresswell last season who was cash viable slate from slate to slate. And this season, he hasn't been in the same kind of form. He showed a little bit of it last slate. Uh, but, yeah, it's been a, a slight disappointment in that retrospect. Now, Bournemouth's main issue is that they're a team of redundancy. Uh, in, in terms of what they have, they duplicate it rather than bringing in some sort of different flavor or uh, try to make a, a composed uh, balanced team. 
Uh, Ryan Frazier and Junior Stanislaus are the same type of player playing the same position, uh, playing the same role, taking away from set pieces. They eat each other's set pieces, so immediately they cross each other off. And since they play on two different wings, and one of them is likely to come off for the likes of David Brooks, who's 7.1K this slate, uh, it's a really heavy ass to expect any of the three wingers to really produce. Now, if you're going to go with one, you can usually go with Ryan Frazier because sometimes he just gets a little bit of obs uh, an obscene ceiling that the other two can't just hope to match period under basically any circumstances now at home against west ham isn't exactly the circumstance i'm looking to target but they are at home and west ham is very capable of allowing goals they're west ham so it it wouldn't surprise me to see a 2-1 game, 2-2 game here. Uh, very significantly, if you're not on this uh, game stack game, if you're not on the Fabanski side of things, uh, you can always roll with this because there are better keepers than Fabanski, though he is a good option. So the big thing here is that if Callum Wilson actually hasn't been confirmed out for this slate, this out has been in relation to last slate. So I'm expecting at some point today he will be confirmed out, and then we'll know that actually let's... Since I left work, he wasn't out. Exactly. So, he hasn't actually been confirmed out for this slate yet. But, in terms of the redundancy talk that I was just going on, him and Josh King are identical players. They do the exact same thing. They're the exact same style of player. And they rarely correlate together because they're literally doing the exact same thing. And not every player can do the exact same thing at the exact same time. The team can't attack down both wings at the same time. Ryan Frazier and uh, whoever's on the other side, Stanislas, Stanislas excuse me, or, or Brooks, they all can't do things at the exact same time. So it's really tough to jump on a team like Bournemouth who have been playing so absolutely brutal as of late. Like in terms of across this slate, Bournemouth may be the coldest team of this slate. Um, only won twice in their previous like 10 games so this isn't and they're brutal at home too so it's not like this is a situation where we can actually rely on a team at home to get that meta home swing there's just not a lot there to offer uh so the main thing to remember here is that they've been allowing two goals on such a consistent consistent basis that it's definitely something to bet for and if you're doing that and you're using someone like Philippe Anderson in that role, you have to hope all the other games don't surpass two goals, or at least his raw point production. Otherwise, all those other AK guys you gave up on could very easily surpass. So you're going to need like a two, three goal game here from West Ham to be overly relevant. Uh, but Bournemouth are just as capable of scoring a couple too. If So this is what I was getting at earlier. If Josh King is playing and Callum Wilson is not at all, definitely roll with some Josh King. But I would probably keep him to a game stack before I would keep him to uh, like using him as a high exposure GPP option. I also think he rolls great as a low, low exposure GPP option. If you need someone in the final few cards of your day uh, or your final card of the day and you need someone a little bit different, I think Josh King absolutely fits that bill because with no Callum Wilson, he's going to take the penalty shots. And it wasn't that long ago that West Ham were like notoriously bad at taking fouls and conceding penalties. So, yeah, I'll say a 2-1 West Ham win, uh, maybe a 2-2 draw, maybe even a 3-2 West Ham win. I'll be very surprised if this game ends 0-0. Uh, I think it's in the uh, the 12 times these teams have played, was it? Um, five times they've played at Bournemouth, both teams have scored. Uh, so, yeah, uh, they, uh, they're they very capable here of getting goals. West Ham are very capable of letting in at least one. Uh, West Ham have been scoring two at a consistent rate. Bournemouth have been allowing two at a consistent rate. Uh, let's go 2-1 two, one, two, West Ham uh, for the win. Next game on the slate, we have Crystal Palace traveling to Liverpool. This is the big one. This is... The game of the slate. This is one of those games of the season that in a month's time, people are going to look back on and say, wow, this is where things change. Now, for a little bit of backstory, Liverpool have never won the English Premier League before. 
and basically every fan base of every club is rallying together against Liverpool. Nobody wants to see Liverpool win. Now, a few years ago, they had a chance, and coming into three games left, they were leading uh, the league. <clears throat> Excuse me, and uh, for anyone who hasn't seen it, just type into Google, don't let it slip, and you can see what happened. Steven Gerrard, in a famous post-speech in a huddle, said, don't let this slip, boys, we don't let this slip, and then against Chelsea, for basically whoever won the, gets the English Premier League title, uh, he slipped and fell and gave Chelsea a breakaway to go in and score and basically win the game. So, yeah, um... Liverpool are notorious for screwing things up and I can't think of a better way for them to start screwing up this season's story than losing at home to Crystal Palace after only conceding three goals all season at home. So this is just my narrative take. I'm really excited about it. There's a lot more to, the, to it that as well. Liverpool are still great plays. They're going to be extremely highly owned. There's other teams this slate that are going to be better than Liverpool. And on top of all this as well, uh, Palace just uh, have been really good as of late. Like, really, really good. So, here's my Palace spiel. Basically, Palace have made a career out of staying in, the, staying in the English Premier League in modern times by doing the same thing over and over, mostly with Wayne Hennessy. And what they do is they start their season with Wayne Hennessy, though they shouldn't, and they have like historically bad starts every season. And then they kind of start mingling their way back through some results, and eventually the coaching staff decides Wayne Hennessy isn't their goaltender anymore, and they go to their other goaltender. Uh, last year it was Speroni, uh, and what ends up happening is that this backup goaltender comes in and absolutely steals the show for about four or five games. Things go really well. Everyone's really excited, and then either the backup goaltender screws up, embarrasses himself, loses an easy game that should have been won, or gets hurt. And, of course, last slate, uh, Guaida got hurt. Uh, so what means now is that Hansi comes back in, and what's been happening is that the game that Hansi comes back in, he gets absolutely embarrassed for like five goals, uh, which is what happened last year. And then after that, he went on a three-game winning streak against obscene clubs that he had absolutely no right to defeat. And once again this season, he's following up his return with the game at Liverpool. Now, like I mentioned earlier, Liverpool have only conceded three goals at home all season. So in order for this to happen, where if Crystal Palace are going to win, so that's the, the real factoid to remember here. It's the if. It's not saying when or if they will or things, it's if the the ceiling is there. If it happens, it's going to be by a shutout or one goal tops. Crystal Palace are not going to score more than two goals. Like that's like the most obscene ceiling in English Premier League history for them to almost literally do half the allowed goals that uh, Liverpool have allowed all season in one game to come from Crystal Palace. Like it just doesn't make sense. So. Yeah, if, if this is going to happen, it's going to be off a 1-0, 1-1 game. And that's very possible right now. Liverpool just haven't been up for it as of late. They've been on a lull, which happens this time of year whenever the league's best teams start to fall apart a little bit. So it, it, that happens after months and months and months of high-octane, high-performance games uh, two to uh, three times a week. So it's uh, it, it takes a toll. Liverpool is aching from that. They should start to turn around over the next month and turn back into the title race unless they let it slip. And this will be the moment they let it slip. Now, in these points, other teams, when they gain, regain footholds, they don't let them go. And if City gets back into this and takes the lead from Liverpool, they're not giving it back. And City should win this weekend. If Chelsea defeats Arsenal, that's also going to put a huge, if not absolute, end to Arsenal's title hopes or finishing for Champions League next season. So, again, assuming that these top teams don't let it slip, I'm going to keep saying that. Um, so, again, it, it's really tough for Liverpool to not screw this up, even though everything says this should be a Liverpool win. And that's why this is a GPP play the slate. If you want to play some Palace, get it in across the board. It's going to be fine. Take Hennessy as a really low value, uh, excuse me, low salary, low floor uh, keeper and potentially hitting a ceiling. If you make six saves and only lets one in, you're flying from 3.5K. Um, I would stay away from the defenders, though my one argument 
to that would be, or excuse me, against that, Juan Bissaka has consistently all season made his peripheral from defensive stats. So if we're considering that he's not going to get the crossing stats, but he's still going to get the defensive, and that's what he does really well, 3.7 is probably too cheap despite who he's going to be going up against. So I don't hate it. I think there's worse plays to slate, but it's definitely not the first place I'm going. But for the conversational sake of this moment, we'll say, yeah, let's take some Juan Bissaka as well. Uh, Milchevic, absolutely, 100%. I'm from a really rural part of Canada and had the chance to play some really high-level soccer. And in doing so, we had to play some teams from Toronto, uh, some teams from Edmonton. And what we did was we defended like crazy and hoped that we would get a counterattack and they would take us down for a penalty shot. And lo and behold, that's what continually happened and we won some really interesting games. This is what Crystal Palace does. They can have gotten more penalty shots in the last two seasons and more teams combined like it's obscene how many goals Milchevic gets from the penalty sh- penalty spot excuse me will it happen this late no am I still chasing penalty shots absolutely do I think Crystal Palace, ha- Crystal Palace has it in them to get down to the other end of the field get into the box and draw a foul 100% especially if someone on Liverpool by the name of uh Never mind, I was going to say Lovren, if he was playing, I, I would absolutely see a, uh, a penalty shot coming. But I'm still on to it. A lot of that has to do with the fact that uh, William, Wilfred Zaha is back. He's back. He's back. It's okay. We can admit it now. It's still not news. Uh, you can still get him on a super buy low, especially this late. 5.2K, do it in either format. He, he's going to get four or five shots. Uh, I don't see Liverpool stopping that from happening. Uh, he's he's at that level. He's Hazard, he's Hazard good, but plays on one of the worst teams in the league. So he's more than capable of dominating uh, an entire attack by himself and going down and getting a shot on net at least three times a game against Liverpool. So I have no problem taking him in either format. I think it's risky in cash. Uh, but again, he's just playing at such a high level right now that I have no issue with it. Um, if he was 7K, this wouldn't be a discussion. It would be the easiest fade of the slate. But at 5.2K, you really don't need very much. And as of late, Liverpool haven't really been showing that they're as like rock solid away from home. And I've been kind of waiting for a little bit of regression at home to finally start taking place. It could even happen today with, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, this weekend with a, a 2-1 uh, Crystal Palace win. Like, something crazy. Uh, like, all they need is a penalty shot. All they need is a penalty shot. If Crystal Palace gets a penalty shot, this is a completely different game. It doesn't matter what the score is. Even if the score is 2-1 uh, after the penalty shot goal. Uh, like, if it's 2 nothing and they get a penalty shot... This is a real game again. Now, if Liverpool are up 3, this is basically over and the whole idea is shot. But again... Um, I wouldn't suggest taking Hennessy in cash. Obviously, there's a little bit too much risk there. But Zaha is going to be a 90-minute threat uh, against Liverpool. Uh, if they get up, they're going to t- turn off a little bit, and he'll be able to catch them on the surprise. If uh, Liverpool are struggling to get ahead, he's going to be a constant threat, and they're going to be so nervous about him for the entire 90 minutes until they start winning the game. If they're behind, all Palace is going to do is literally just send him repeatedly to go and go while they defend and hope, like I said, for a penalty shot after he gets taken down. And... Zaha is absolutely, he he had like four dives last slate and they were so good that he didn't even get penalized for three of the four dives. So yeah, I have <clears throat> little, issue with Zaha, little issues with uh, taking Zaha this slate in either format. But in terms of Liverpool, they're Liverpool. I don't think a lot needs to be said. If you aren't familiar at this point, you probably shouldn't play this slate and take a little bit to learn the teams and figure out who exactly Liverpool is. Um, as I've said, three goals allowed this season at home. Uh, they've all two of the three were against the big six sides, so it's not really like we're looking for a lot from Crystal Palace here from a statistical basis uh, of default. Now, in terms of game theory and how I'm going to attack this game, <clears throat> excuse me. Last slate I got it wrong. Uh, last slate I faded Salha for Shakiri and. Zaha, or excuse me, and Salah, I said Zala. Saha, Zaha, Salah got the penalty shot that I was expecting to come to Milner, who never played, and I never played Salah enough in return. 
especially in cash. Uh, so this slate, however, I am going to be jumping on the Sadio Mane train. I'm all about this. This slate, 8.2K is simply too cheap going up against uh, Crystal Palace. Now, I know he hasn't been the best of best players on Liverpool. I know his minutes haven't been the best of best as well. Uh, but I said, as I said, excuse me, 8.2K is just too cheap for someone uh, of his ability. And the vast majority of his goals have come at home this season so if you're looking for an opportunity to play him it's at home and if we're looking at an opportunity at home to play him it's against a team like Crystal Palace so the, the main thing for me here is that's a massive salary difference that's huge basically 3k on the board so um yeah I have absolutely no issue pivoting to Mane and really in, in straight double ups, obviously I'd stay with uh, Salah, but in terms of head to head, I'd even pivot to Mane, chase the goal, and uh, see if you can catch some people off guard with that. Because uh, I think it is coming, and uh, this slate it would make sense. So let's say, for fairness sake, a 2 0 Liverpool win, maybe 3 0 if they're super, super lucky, but. I really think a one nothing Crystal Palace win is absolutely in the books here if they have a tremendous game, which is absolutely 100% in their realm of possibility. So uh, I'm still going to say 2 nothing Liverpool, just to be fair. Next game on the slate, we have Brighton traveling to Man United. And even less needs to be said about this, so I'll very quickly glaze over it. Brighton are way worse away from home to the point that they're one of historically they have one of the craziest home home away splits on the go right now now they did have a great game last late but in terms of their generality here when they're away they're going to lose and when they're at home they'll take on literally any team in the league and this late they happen to be going up against man united now in the past when I, if I'm checking myself because I regularly wreck myself, when I check myself, I've noticed that uh, in the past I've made these statements where like Brighton are useless, don't take them, they've got nobody, really extreme wise. And what ends up happening is that the other team doesn't show up and Brighton ends up being okay plays just simply based on the fact that they were really cheap and nothing bad happened to them, which is really all you need sometimes from really cheap guys. So in terms of this slate, Brighton should be useless. They should be pointless, and you can basically fade them and not feel too bad about what could come. Uh, that's just how bad they've been away from home this season. Maybe Sally March. Uh, if uh, you want to chase someone. But again, his, his minutes haven't been solid enough as of late to really uh, rely on that. And that, that was kind of gut, gut bursting. So wait and see if he gets another 90 minute game. They'll be more confident jumping back on. But Bright Brighton have just not been very, very good as of late. They're been, they've been mixing things up up front. It hasn't really been working out as well. And uh, without Matt Ryan, who's away at the Asian Cup with Australia, they're just not the same team. So... Yeah, uh, that's all I'm going to say about Brighton. If you end up falling on someone on Brighton, just make sure it's not a defender. Uh, maybe Pascal Grobe if you think that he can get enough floor from that. But, again, the, the minutes are just really inconsistent. And there's guys who should be getting 90 minutes who don't get 90 minutes. And it's tough <clears throat> when they take off their three best players in both DFS and real life. So... There's just not a lot to look at when Brighton are away from home, especially when they're going up against easily the league's hottest team right now in Man United. Uh, David DeGay put on an absolute show last slate. He does this once a season where he makes 10 to 14 saves and people's minds blow because it came against Tottenham or Arsenal or Chelsea. And what ends up happening is that... A lot of people jump on him and just continually make money from him for weeks and weeks now because he's back and he's a god and he's next to perfect. So that's my spiel. Anytime he's not literally the most expensive keeper, you can literally just do this and you're probably going to be okay. Especially whenever Man United are playing as well as they are. Especially when they're at home. Especially when they're against Brighton. Especially when Brighton's away from home. A bunch of things mixed together there just to make Man United basic. Uh... 
I'm going to avoid the defenders simply because they haven't been crossing enough as is. Now, if Ashley Young is starting, and it's obviously, uh, or I should say, obscenely obvious that nobody else is going to be taking set pieces, maybe I'll jump on him. Uh, I can think of worse ideas. Uh, a lot of my attention will be drawn the more forward we go. Paul Pogba has two goals in back-to-back -back home games. No Man United player has gone three straight since Ronaldo did it back in 2008. So that'll be pretty interesting to see if he can dominate at that kind of level, which is what Man United are going to need if they're going to ever hope to get trophies again. So is he in play? Absolutely. Goes back, though, to the spiel I had earlier about uh, Philippe Anderson. And if you're going to take Philippe Anderson, it has to be that second spot. Otherwise, if you go Salah and not Philippe Anderson and Pogba, you can't afford Philippe Anderson. Or if you go Salah and Pogba and not Philippe Anderson, you're, you're not going to be able to afford Philippe Anderson. Now, if you're asking me which I prefer, that's actually tough. Probably Fleet Anderson in GPP, Pogba in cash. But in terms of overall ceiling, I do think Man United has a better ceiling than West Ham. I just think Fleet Anderson probably has a better ceiling than Pogba. It just takes maybe a little bit of a better game from West Ham because Man United should be up for this as well. Uh, winner, like I said, six straight uh, on the go. Rashford's been absolutely incredible since uh, Schultz has taken over. He's got five uh he's he scored in five this past six go, six games uh started every game played uh, all the minutes that you possibly need from someone at a massive salary to succeed uh, he has a decent enough floor that you can rely on in either cat in either cash or gpp I, I won't say he's Ronaldo at this point, but he's definitely reaching that kind of production levels where you can rely on him in either format. You know, as all your concern really is, is he going to play 90 minutes? If he's going to play 90 minutes, he's probably the best shot out of all the expensive salaries to get uh, double digits. Uh, he's not as goal reliant. So, yeah, uh, I would probably stick to that. I'm not really interested in Sanchez. He's not playing very much, nor is he really showing up. Uh, the same can be said with Lukaku. His miss just haven't been there. It'll be interesting to see how Man United start. Uh, but uh, in terms of the targets for Man United, I'm definitely looking at some Rashford. Uh, either format and in the grand scheme of things Man United probably have a better team ceiling than Liverpool uh, than Chelsea uh, so yeah I think Rashford is the best play of all the higher salaries not because he's necessarily the best player but because he has one of the more reliable floors of the group is playing in an incredible matchup at home and uh, I know Sal is checking the boxes so far. He's just 1K more expensive. And I'm never really keen on paying for the most expensive guy unless I know he's going to take the most shots of the slate or at least be involved in the most scoring chances of the slate. And that's not the case for Sal. That's Rashford. That's what Rashford's going to be doing. So, yeah, it, I want to say a 6-1 Man United win, a 6-0 Man United win to celebrate uh, six straight uh, EPL victories. Uh, but I think a, a 4 nothing ceiling is probably a much more reasonable task or an ask, excuse me. Uh, what I will say, though, is uh, Man United should score three times and Brighton will not score more than once. So let's say uh, a 3-1 victory for Man United. Next game on the slate, we have Cardiff traveling to Newcastle. That's really it. That's basically the game. That's all you really need to know right there. This is going to be a hogwash of crap games. Now, going back to what I just talked about, about saying extremes with Brighton, um, this is just a really bad game. In particular, last season, I can't remember the amount of times I saw Swansea and Newcastle play and scratch my head if anyone was going to acquire a fantasy point. Uh, in any kind of abundance in 90 minutes and it never happened all the guys would finish with 4.5 and no one could figure out why and it's because it was absolutely garbage both ways just nobody doing anything and that's probably what's going to happen here again Cardiff are just as bad as Brighton away from home uh, except maybe a little bit better right now than Brighton as a whole 
there isn't really a whole lot I'm looking at here at all. Maybe if Cunningham starts as a wing back, uh, it, it, it's tough knowing what they're going to do with their formations. Uh, last night, Cam Rasso is one of the biggest letdowns in one of the biggest ghost spots. Wouldn't surprise me if he comes back and smashes this slate just because that's DFS sometimes. Uh, from 6K, that isn't even that big of a risk. For some GPP, I wouldn't mind to Cam Rasso because Newcastle have been statistically the worst home team in the league it, it actually hasn't been close outside of like uh bournemouth and their their like league worst actually bournemouth has like the second worst defense in the league i forgot to mention that earlier newcastle has one of the worst league offenses they're at least the bracket has been capable but they're still very bad on the production level so yeah in terms of cardiff uh what i am going to say here is uh, they're, they're probably going to score, but not more than once. And that's a lot to be said about Newcastle. Are these salaries good enough to go chasing one goal? No, they really aren't. So I'm not interested in actually taking any Cardiff players for that reason. Like I said, you can get away with uh, Cam Rasa. You can get away with Cunningham if he's a wing back. Patterson, maybe. He's been someone I've been chasing for a while and obviously hasn't hit. So uh, maybe that's another place that could come. But I just don't see it coming in enough abundance to justify the salaries, which you can find in other places like uh, Zaha and Crystal Palace. So in terms of Newcastle, uh, it's really the same same old story. Debraca is a little bit too expensive from his salary, or, or from his, uh, excuse me, relevance in terms of the slate. His... Uh, Saves won't be as high as you're going to need for 5.2K. Cardiff aren't that big of a, a, sh a shooting team. And in terms of an overall, like, they're hurt. They're really banged up in the back. Their defensive midfielders are hurt, so their core is going to be really weak. All you can really hope for is Richie gets the ball a bunch and pumps in 12 crosses. And from 6.6K, that isn't the worst idea. Uh, my biggest concern is always that Newcastle isn't really a ceiling team, and the best Richie can hope for is an assist. I would like to see a goal. Uh, I think Cam Rasa can score a goal, so it would be more likely to chase that in a GPP. Maybe some Richie in cash. None of these guys are very high exposure for me. Let's put it that way. Uh, I, I just don't like to look at this game. It stinks a mile away. It's a 1-1 max ceiling game. And even the 0-0 draw is going to be pointless. Because what's going to happen is that neither keeper is going to see enough shots. To really justify either their salary or compare them to the other options surrounding them. So I'll say 1-1 draw. And uh, we'll just move on from that. Next game on the slate. Everton uh, traveling to Southampton. This is going to be a really good game. I'm really looking forward to this one as well. I think there's going to be a lot to offer. Um, Everton historically have been another one of those home away split teams. And they honestly haven't been this that bad this season. Um, now in terms of overall like this slate how are they shaping up Southampton's always bad. So I never really worry too much about that. Now in terms of how is Everton, obviously their form hasn't been great recently. They're, I've only won a couple of games uh, in, uh, I think, 10. Uh, so it's just not something I'm instantly drawn to in that sense. But at the same time, Southampton at home is always a really wide open team. They have been in the past, and since they got this new manager, they've really turned into a really, really turned into a DFS friendly side, both attacking wise and in terms of allowing production. I really like Angus Gunn. I hope he gets more time. If he does, absolutely love him. This slate from 4.7k simply because he's such a good goaltender, and no one will be looking to own that against Everton, who should provide him with a massive ceiling. Uh, it, in terms of Everton, I'm always just don't play Pickford. Just don't do it. It's just way easier not to do it. Uh, the chance of him getting a clean sheet is super low. Like, yeah, that's great. Bournemouth is really bad right now. Uh, and it just hasn't happened outside of that enough. Again, Cardiff, really bad. Like, great. Uh, I guess you can say uh, Southampton have been really bad. But at the same time, they, they've been playing a lot better as of late. And it's not something I'm ready to discount instantly. Where uh, Everton have just been bad at the back for a while. Uh, for years. Dengue is always in cash. Always can play him. Always viable. There's, 
he is the new hall of boss except without the fouls so yeah i have absolutely no issue with him really i would chase uh, coleman and gpp uh before I chase Dinge, just simply for the salary savings. Maybe do a double pivot, something like a Coleman and Sadio Mane, instead of chasing the Sala and Dinge, which I see a lot of people doing, or I foresee a lot of people doing. Uh, Sigurdsson and Cash, 8.5K. Again, one of the issues here is that if you don't take Sigurdsson next after that big salary, chances are you're not going to afford Sigurdsson. I think he has a better floor than Pogba. I think he has a better floor than... Uh, a lot of uh, the 8K guys, but the issue is that he's also more expensive than a lot of the 8K guys and playing in a game that doesn't necessarily offer the biggest ceiling. Uh, so it is viable, obviously. It's just not my absolute favorite play of the slate from 8.5K. If he was 6.5K, it would be a dream come true, but that extra 2K is massive to the slate whenever someone like Salah costs 11K. Uh, but yeah, uh, Rich Elson and GPP, if you would like, 7.2K, again, it's that if he isn't the second option. So you know the ownership's going to be pretty split along those salaries. Uh, but a as a whole here, I really am not looking for a lot from Everton in terms of floors. I will chase some ceilings. A lot of my attention, though, is going to fall on some Southampton GPP. Um, they're quite injured up front. Charlie Austin isn't really re ready to play. And uh, they just sold uh, Gabadini. So Shane Long looks like he's going to be getting 90 minutes once more. If not 90 minutes, close enough to it from 5.2K where he can risk that in GPP. And risk that Everton haven't been good enough away from home, let alone at any time keeping, keeping clean sheets. I think a lot of people will be chasing the Everton clean sheet following last slate and seeing pick versus 24. I won't be. I'll be pivoting off the other side of that and chasing a Shane Long goal. The issue with Southampton here is that they had a midweek game, uh, an FA Cup replay against Derby County that they lost in the penalty shootout, which is a full 120-minute game and then the penalty shot. So it'll be interesting to see if they rotate players, how, uh, how much energy they'll have, if they'll last the 90 minutes. But in terms of, yeah, it, it's really tough, right? It's really, really tough. That's why I'm on Angus Gunn. That's why I like Angus Gunn so much. I only really see Southampton succeeding if they keep a clean sheet. And I think that's absolutely viable with Angus Gunn on any slate uh, until more people get on him. So, yeah, uh, in terms of this game, I think it offers lots of options. Uh, but uh, a lot of it will depend on how Southampton line up and trying to get those role production players on Southampton and GPP. Uh, I will say... 1-1 one, one draw, 2-1 Everton win, maybe with a late game winner. Uh, but in terms of their production won't be, Everton's production won't be high enough, nor condensed enough to make someone or the lot of them the best team to play this slate. Next game on the slate, we have Burnley traveling to Watford. Once again, okay, done. You don't even have to worry. I know saying extremes isn't good. Again, I hope by acknowledging this, that will downplay it a little bit. But this isn't a fluke. This should continue for quite some time. Uh, draws will be far more likely before Burnley will lose games. A lot of that will also have to do with the fact that Heaton won't be getting blown out. Watford or Watford, it's really tough. But yeah, 3.9K is just always too cheap for, for Tom Heaton. Period. Done. End of story. He could let him in four goals. It is Burnley. But that kind of script isn't something to really consider as a viable concern. It's a, the deepest of deep GPP scripts. The worst case scenario for Tom Heaton is letting in two goals. After that, it's a little bit unheard of. Underneath that, you're still absolutely within your projections. So yeah, I have uh, no problem with Tom Heaton either format. Easily the top goaltender play this slate on DraftKings from 3.9K. Um, outside of that, however, it's good to see that the prices have started to drop a little bit of these guys, but the minutes still aren't there for guys uh, that need it, and the floor still isn't really, or the ceiling isn't there, excuse me, on guys that need it. Now, 3.9K isn't that big of an ask, I understand that, but at the same time, um, you're really going to need a special t kind of script to really look to chase 3.9K on a guy like Charlie Taylor. 
Uh, so yeah, not my favorite go. Uh, I think uh, someone like uh, Dwight McNeil, if Johan Berg Goodmanson continues to miss, is a must play uh, in either format from 6.5. Uh, absolutely can't miss in this guy if uh, he'll be handling most of the set pieces. His minutes are still solid. Just a solid, a solid, solid, solid option for double digits. And uh, from 6.5K, that's not an issue whatsoever. Uh, but yeah, for the rest of the team, it's really tough. You're really chasing minutes. That's a big thing. I don't mind Ashley Barnes. I think he's been ultra relevant as of late as well. And anytime you can get six fantasy points, you're going to be fine, especially this slate when he's below 6K. So I don't have an issue with Ashley Burns either, but Dwight McNeil is definitely where I'll be putting a lot of my focus this slate. Uh, sorry, I'll put Dingye in there like I'm supposed to. But yeah, um, a lot of that, again, has to do with Johan not playing. If Johan's in, play the Johan. Uh, it could be a camera S of last slate where he only plays 70 minutes all of it ineffectual and ends up coming on for Dwight who ends up getting the goal. Uh, so yeah, I just like Burnley a lot this slate. In terms of Watford, it's tough because both Watford and Burnley are two teams that have dramatically changed their fortunes around by going out and getting a good keeper. And Ben Foster is a good keeper with good defensive options. Holobos hasn't been the same defender as late. It's good to see him get back to the 12 crosses, but he was also getting back into his fouls. Uh, so he had an excellent game. Nothing to take away from him. See if he can jump back here again. Taking both expensive defenders isn't really the way I for plan this slate going but I can think of worse ideas that's for sure uh, their floors are definitely both there my main concern is that I like Heaton so much that I just don't see Holobos getting any kind of ceiling at all where you can still chase a little bit of ceiling in some defenders here for cash they're still going to have floor as well uh, so yeah in terms of Watford the main issue for Watford is always the guys who should be great aren't. The guys who should be bad are great. The guys who should be doing lots of things don't. And the guys who should be doing absolutely nothing do basically everything. Uh, so, yeah, again, that's a classic Troy Deeney score. Uh, Delefeu, again, someone who should be absolutely lights out and just can't seem to get things going yet in the Premier League. Pereira is someone who, again, should be lights out and just hasn't found a ceiling. That isn't going to cut it. Yeah, I would rather take the Burnley side with Tom Heaton and just roll from there and see how that takes me. Uh, in terms of this game, I want to say 2-0 Burnley win, 1-0 Burnley win. is probably going to be pretty boring, not a lot of offense, but tons of defense, tons of saves on either side for either keeper. Uh, and that's why I don't mind either keeper for uh, for either game, either side of this game, excuse me. But I'd probably take Heaton either format long before I would take Foster's salary. Final game of the slate, we have Chelsea traveling to Arsenal. And like I mentioned earlier, I'm really excited about this game. Uh, basically speaking, Chelsea away from home is like Liverpool. They're not the same team away from home. They're much worse, and they're probably going to concede. Uh, Arsenal's goalkeeper, uh, Lino, has literally kept one clean sheet all season. Peter Cech's retiring. He's checked out, I guess you could say. Good dude, but uh, had a great history it's just I don't see Arsenal keeping a clean sheet again anytime soon. So we know Chelsea are going to score. And like I said, Chelsea have been really bad away from home. They have been conceding a lot. We should expect Arsenal to score as well. So, yeah, uh, game stack this. I really don't have an issue with that. I also think that because these players do offer, it's, it's tough because their salaries are so much. They offer that second pick syndrome. And since you don't know if, William's going to start or it's going to be Pedro or who it's going to be. You're going to need to take multiples of these guys in order to ensure that you are offering enough pivot to work with. Um, yeah, the, the Alonzo Hazard stack is always in play. Always. You can always go with that. Uh, in terms of where I'm looking this slate, I think... It would be nice to think I could afford something like this, but I know I can't. Uh, I would probably have to drop out that and keep rolling with this in a GPP setting. Um, yeah, it, 
because, yeah, Pierre Aubameyang should score a goal this slate. Hazard should get in on a goal this slate. Williams should be in on a goal this slate. That doesn't mean they're all going to score separate goals. Uh, it just means that there should be some serious goal production this slate. And both the keepers have been so bad that it would really surprise me if both of them keep clean sheets. So Chelsea should definitely score. Chelsea, statistically speaking, Chelsea most certainly are going to score this slate. It's just a matter of who and trying to game theory yourself. Like last slate in the showdown, I took Pedro and that got me paid because nobody was on Pedro and everyone was on William and Hazard. I don't see that taking place again this late it's probably going to jump back to as uh, see i'd rather take a, a rashford and william than try to fit in a hazard and rashford uh just because i think william offers a lot more upside and floor than uh hazard does at this moment from this salary especially considering it's 8.3 again you can kind of roll with a little money in your life here too and stick with that 8.3 8.5 8k range of players uh, obviously that does really work with Ama Bang, but give you some idea here, a little bit of a GPP taste. Uh, like, yeah, th there's nothing wrong with this whatsoever. The, the late game is going to be tough. The late game is really going to be important because like I said, there's going to be goals. And if you decide to fade that you're going to need a ton of separation and a ton of hope, hoping that nobody produces a consistent, uh, production game where they get all the goals where it's exclusively them and all these guys on both these teams are totally possible of doing that so i'm a little bit concerned in that sense but as a whole i have no problem chasing a 2-1 chelsea win a 2-2 draw 1-1 draw just don't chase a clean sheet from this game you can even chase a defender but you're going to need them to actually hit their ceiling so not in cash or excuse me uh, you know their uh, ceiling is going to be crushed because there won't be a clean sheet uh, so you're going to have to try and roll with them in cash, uh, which isn't really that viable. So, yeah, the uh, little circle talk there for you. Sorry. In terms of where I'm going, I'm going to say a 2-1 Chelsea win and hopefully finish off the late hammer with uh, a little bit of William Love. So, yeah, that's it. Thanks a lot for tuning in, everyone. Uh, Rad Rob Diamond on Twitter. Sir Robert Six and all the main sites. Rotopros.com. Get over. Check us out. Sign up. Uh, get in our Slack. It's a great time. It's absolutely bumping right now. Uh, all our sports are slamming. Uh, we're having an excellent 2019. Make sure to check us out. Uh, hit me up on Twitter with any questions. Thank you so much for tuning in. As always, best of luck, best of luck everyone. Uh, much love, and hopefully see you at the top.